Um, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us again here online with the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium. Uh, my name is Leela and I will um, help with questions here today, um, especially those who are joining us via Zoom. There's a chat section here, uh, so you can scroll down. It looks like a few people have already found that. There's also a Q&A box, which I will keep open and um, raise my hand and, and interrupt uh, Bobby from time to time with your questions. Um, we also will have um, another class uh, starting at 1 p.m., which is the Tackling Compost, uh, do-it-yourself home projects. Uh, but for now, this is Living in a Greenhouse with Bobby Farley's Rubio. So thank you so much. <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, hold on a second. I lost my screen here. I'm not sure why. I Oh, here, hold on. There we go. All right, everyone. I'm here at the Barnett Public Library, which is currently closed to the public, but has a better internet connection than anywhere else I can go. And uh, uh, before I get started, I wanted to show you a visual demonstration of something that I have right in front of me, a very simple device called a radiometer. And I'm going to turn on a very bright light to simulate the sun. Ooh. And now, I hope you notice something funny about the radiometer. It's speeding up. It's going faster and faster and faster. And I wonder why that is. Let me see if I turn off this light, the bright light. Maybe we'll notice that it starts to slow down. This is no trick, folks. There is no hidden motors. There's no solar panel or electrical circuit or batteries hidden inside of this. I see that somebody wrote in the chat, is it because it reacts to heat? Well, sort of. To be more honest, I would have to say it reacts to light. Let me hold it up for you so you can see up close in the camera. It's a bunch of white diamonds and black diamonds. And they're on a little spindle that allows them to move around uh, easily like a thimble of glass, per, you know, sort of up on a needle. So there's very low friction, uh, but there's nothing else that makes it move. And if I blow on it with my own wind, obviously that's not going to affect it. I could shake it and make it move. But if I let it sit still on the tabletop, as you see here, not too clumsily, I hope. It's moving just from my shaking. Let's see if I can get it to stop. Let it rest. It's kind of vibrating still. And then if I turn, there's already lights on, so it's kind of moving just from the small amount of ambient light in the room. But if I turn on a much brighter, stronger light, oh boy, it starts moving much faster. So somebody said it has something to do with heat. I wonder, I wonder if any of the folks out there can write into the chat or ask a question or use that format too propose an answer does anybody think they figured this out radiometer light goes in but once it gets in it hits different surfaces some of the surfaces are white some of the surfaces are black and when the light hits them different things happen and i want you to think of this device as a miniature model a super simplified model for a planet atmosphere. And look at the diamonds on the inside as sort of a super simplified model for the solid surfaces underneath that atmosphere, like land or the liquid surfaces, like water, or even things that are solid that are not land, like frozen water, ice. All of the earth is covered by different substances. We've got rock, we've got trees, we've got water, we've got ice. And whatever surface you're talking about, when light hits it, something different happens. And when that light shines in from the sun, it penetrates our atmosphere. Our atmosphere is transparent to light, just like this glass bulb. But once something gets into our atmosphere, well, can it easily get back out again? It so, looks like we had a couple people just saying like a heat wave and that stuff is attract or black attracts light. So some of the things that you were just talking about, but. Right. Well, now I think some folks are getting on the right track if they're thinking that the black and the white have a different response. Think of what happens to the sunlight that hits the white diamonds. You could see it in the camera. 
the light from the bulb hitting the white diamonds is reflected very brightly back to you. If you see it in your camera, that means a lot of the light from the light bulb, which you can't see, is being bounced in your direction. And that means it's being reflected very much like what you see when you look at a mirror. The light is doing, bouncing away. But notice the black diamonds. They're receiving the same amount of light as the white diamonds, but they're not reflecting it back at you. They're doing something else with the light. Now, just so you know, according to the laws of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created and energy cannot be destroyed, but energy can be transformed in infinite numbers of ways. So if you can imagine what's happening on the black diamond, we're getting a transformation of energy from a form of light that we can see with our eyes to something that we cannot see with our eyes. But unfortunately, I don't have a Zoom touch version yet. So that sense is not being conveyed to you across the internet. But if you were sitting here, if you could see where my hand is, you would be also feeling something besides the light you see, because there is a lot of heat also being generated when that light hits a surface, the desk is getting warm. And so just imagine what's happening to the little black diamonds in there. They're getting really hot, but the light that you is hitting them is not being reflected back at us in visible form. It's being reflected back at us, well, in a form that we cannot see. We call it infrared light. But just for today's purposes, let's say the black ones are getting hot, the white ones are not. And as the black diamonds are making heat, they're warming up the air that's next to them. So the white diamonds are reflecting the light and they're not making much heat. So they're not warming up the air next to them. So if I turn the light off again and maybe let it slow down a little bit, you might notice that the direction of travel is so that the black diamonds are pushing forward and the white diamonds are retreating. The, the white diamonds are not contributing to this much, but the black diamonds are acting like little rocket engines. As they get hot, they push around. And if I hold it up this way, you might see the black sides get hot and they cause the whole thing to rotate because they're making the air next to them expand. So it's actually not that different from how a rocket works, but it's a very simple one. And that heat causes air to expand. If you've ever seen uh, you know, hot air balloons, you know that hot air expands and it takes up less space than cold air. So as the black diamonds heat up the air next to them, they cause that air to expand and that pushes, kicks the diamonds around and around and around. Now, you might be thinking, what on the earth is like those black and white diamonds? Well, we don't have spinning whirly gigs in our atmosphere, but we do have dark surfaces and light surfaces. And the dark surfaces cause air to heat up and expand. And the white surfaces or the light colored surfaces don't have that much of an effect. Think of a sheet of ice like a glacier on a mountain versus a bare rock mountain made out of dark colored stone. And you can see which one's going to get hot in the sun and which one's going to be bright in the sun, but not necessarily turning that light into heat. So I hope you understand this simple device, a radiometer. It's a pretty cool way to explore energy conversion. But I also want you to understand that it's kind of like a model of a planet. And I actually want to switch now to an app that I have on my iPad here. Well, let me turn off the super bright light. And I've got an app. Let's see if I can set it up in a way so that you folks don't see too much glare. But this is an app called Living Earth. And you can get it on the Apple App Store. I'm going to make it center itself on where we are right now in Barnet, Vermont, at the library where I am. It's 36 degrees outside right now. And before I go on too far, I want to show you folks a picture. You see, uh, I have neighbors who have a greenhouse, a literal, honest-to-goodness greenhouse. And we're going to be talking about the greenhouse effect as it, as it relates to our planet and climate. But let me start with the actual greenhouse. Can you folks see this picture? I hope, Leela, is this clear on the screen? This was a picture taken today by my neighbors. They live across the road from me. And today is a cloudy day. It's actually snowing, snowing right now, excuse me. And um, even though it's snowing and cloudy inside their greenhouse, even though you may notice they have actually some windows open for fresh air, it was seven degrees warmer inside that greenhouse this morning with the clouds and the snow than it is outside. So inside that greenhouse, it was about 40 degrees 
And if they decide that it gets a little too cold, they can close some of those windows that you see and make it even warmer in there. And if you look at the hoops on the rows, they can actually cover those with another sheet of, of transparent material like this plastic to give another layer of insulation. And they don't have to worry about their plants freezing, even though it's been below freezing for the last several nights. So this is how a farmer can use a greenhouse to grow food, even in times when the weather is not what right. So well, how, I think if you've ever been to a greenhouse, you may understand how this works. And maybe you can see how similar it is to our radiometer. Light can get in. And once it gets in, it strikes that dark surface on the ground and that warms up the soil. And if cold wind blows outside, it's not going to affect the greenhouse so much, especially once they seal it up, because that greenhouse is almost like an artificial atmosphere. And as it gets light, it gets warmed up. So this one is a human designed and controlled environment, but you could say that our planet is a natural greenhouse. No, we're not surrounded by a thick layer of plastic, but we are surrounded by an atmosphere that acts like a bubble of air. Our atmosphere is transparent, so light can get in. And once that light gets in, it interacts with the surface on the ground, and that affects how hot or cold it gets. So all of this has to do with our seasonal change, too. But this class is a way to introduce you to the concept of climate change and global warming in a way that helps you understand how our planet works in the normal sense. And then we can go on and add what factors have changed our greenhouse to make it hotter, to make it more effective at trapping heat that has caused the climate change that we're now all seeing. So I'm gonna go back to my live year. Let's see if I can show you this app, Living Earth. And I hope that's easy to see. Lilo, does that look clear to you there? Can you see the planet Earth there? And you can see dark surfaces like the ocean. You can see bright surfaces like the ice cap of Greenland right there. That's a glacier that in the center is more than a mile thick. So there's an enormous amount of water on that piece of land we call Greenland. Yes, I know the name is ironic. However, here is where we live in North America. And this is really cool. This app has the snowpack, so it shows you where the snow in Canada still is. And it shows you where the ice is and the clouds. It uses satellite imagery to calculate these things. So this app actually is a good snapshot for what's going on. But here's another thing to understand when we talk about climate change. We've got this planet. It acts like a greenhouse. But we know some places warm up faster than others. Some places are in the middle of the night where it's getting dark. So let's think about what it would be like if we didn't have this atmosphere. What if I took the bubble of glass off of my radiometer? What if I had an Earth without an atmosphere? So this is a part where I'm going to switch to another app called SolarWalk 2. And this is one that you can download also. Here's the sun. That's what gives us the energy that makes us warm. But are all the planets the same when it comes to how the sunlight interacts with them? Well, this is where I get a little embarrassed, folks, because I'm going to propose a game for you to play at home. But I don't actually want you to do this in real life. I want you to sort of simulate this in your mind. Imagine if you wanted to pretend to be the planets of a solar system and you wanted to create a sun in your backyard and you wanted to model this. Well, I should tell you space is very cold. In the shade outside of the sunlight in the solar system, it's easily 200 below zero or even colder. We're not gonna get cold nights like that in Vermont. So just imagine waiting till the coldest night of winter when it's maybe 20 below, okay? And then you go in your backyard and you set up a big bonfire and you say, that is my sun. And that sun is going to keep me from freezing to death on this 20 below night, okay? Now. This is where the idea gets a little silly. So this is why I only want you to do this in your imagination. Here's planet Mercury, the closest planet to the sun. This model is not to scale, but Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. And if you wanted to pretend to be Mercury in your backyard solar system bonfire simulation, then you would have to stand very close to the bonfire and be completely naked. I know this sounds crazy, but guess what would happen to you if it was 20 below zero 
and you're not wearing any clothes and you're standing outside next to a bonfire. Maybe your face, your sunny side, will feel nice and toasty because of the bonfire, but your tushy will be freezing off at the same time. And that's because you're standing there without any clothes on and Mercury is similar to that. Let's say Mercury compared to the Earth that you see in the background is a naked planet. It has no atmosphere. It's just bare rock. So when the sun shines on it, as you might expect, it gets very hot. In fact, the surface of Mercury can exceed 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Hot, but at the same time, the dark side of Mercury could be colder than 200 below zero. So this would be like you standing outside next to a bonfire without any clothes on on a cold winter's night. Your face would be warm and your tushy would be freezing off at the same time. And if your parents happen to see you acting this foolish way outside on a cold winter's night, they will probably run outside and they'll have some colorful language to share with you. And then they'll wrap you up in a blanket or a jacket and they'll say, what are you doing out here? You're going to freeze to death. And if they put a blanket or a jacket around you, they've time does the dark side of the earth get colder than the bright side of the earth of course it does but the difference is not a difference of 900 degrees <laughs> okay even if you live in a cold part of the earth you might get a few degrees tens of degrees you know colder than you were in the daytime but you're not going to get 900 degrees colder than you were during the daytime and that's because the atmosphere is like a jacket a blanket that the, what your parents responsibly wrapped you in to keep you from having your tushy freeze to death. Okay, so let's talk about some other planets. Venus. In a lot of ways, Venus is like Earth's twin sister. It is a planet that's about the same size as the Earth, and it has an atmosphere, and it has a cloud cover layer that's so thick we can't see through it. But even though Venus is millions of miles farther away from the sun than Mercury, Venus is actually the hottest planet of all of the planets in the solar system. And the reason why is because Venus has too many jackets on. Venus has a greenhouse, just like the Earth, except green, Ven I almost said greenness, sorry. Venus's greenhouse, try saying that 10 times fast. Gr Venus's greenhouse is so effective at trapping heat that it never cools down. In fact, on the side of Venus facing the sun, it's about 900 degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than Mercury. But at night, it cools to nothing. I mean, it doesn't cool down at all. It's about the same temperature. It's about 900 degrees at night. So if you daytime and nighttime side on Venus, the temperature doesn't really change very much because the atmosphere is so thick. So let me put it to you this way. If you're playing that bonfire game and you're being Mercury, you're going to be standing out there naked. If you're going to act like Earth, you're going to put on a responsible jacket, a parka, a sleeping bag, keep yourself warm. But if you want to act like Venus, you have to stand close to the bonfire and then put on 90 jackets. I know that seems absurd, but Venus has literally 90 times more air than our planet does. So that is like having a 90 times larger, thicker jacket. And that means Venus is super hot. So imagine if my neighbors took their greenhouse and wrapped it with 90 more greenhouses around, somehow letting the sunlight still reach inside, it would get so hot that they would boil all their lettuce and it would be steamed vegetables instead of fresh greens. So you can imagine too much atmosphere, too much uh, jacket can keep you too hot. And by the way, it's worth mentioning that Venus's atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide. We now know on Earth that carbon dioxide is very effective at trapping heat. It helps to make the greenhouse warmer, so to speak, because it keeps the heat in. It doesn't let it leave the atmosphere as easily. And it makes sense that Venus is that hot because it's mostly carbon dioxide. It's a little bit closer to the sun than we are. And it's got so much air that it's a greenhouse effect gone wild. Now, in all of the possible iterations of climate change on Earth, no one is expecting that Earth is ever going to become as hot as Venus. But it, we don't have to get to 900 degrees to have some trouble, okay? And so let's wrap up what we've been talking about so far. 
We said Mercury is naked next to the bonfire, f f warm face, frozen tushy. We've got Venus wrapped in 90 blankets, so hot that it doesn't matter which side is facing the fire, it's still hot on all sides. We've got Earth, like the bowl, the bowl of porridge that's just right for Goldilocks. Ah, we get cold, we get hot, but it's all within a limited range that we can manage. And then let's talk about one more rocky planet that does have an atmosphere, the planet where humans will be exploring maybe within a decade, Mars. So Mars is farther from the sun, but it also has a very thin atmosphere. Mars's atmosphere is 1% of what the Earth's is. So just put that into context with the little greenhouse effect game that we're playing. Venus is wearing 90 jackets. Earth is wearing one. Mercury is wearing no jackets. And Mars is wearing a, a sheet of tissue paper, essentially. If it has 1% of the atmosphere that we do, it's too thin to do any good. It would be like if your family saw you outside in the middle of the winter and they thought you were shivering and cold and they brought you a mosquito net to warm you up. You would be like, uh, thanks, but no thanks. That little mosquito net is not going to help me one bit. And just to, to finish up the thought, Mars's atmosphere is also mostly carbon dioxide. But that is a greenhouse gas. But there's simply not enough air in, at all for it to make a big effect. So Mars gets warm. The rocks on Mars, just so you know, they get up to like 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So your toes standing in the sand on Mars might feel okay. You could handle that temperature probably. But at night, it's always about 150 below zero or even colder on Mars. So Mars has not enough of a greenhouse to keep itself warm at night. You could say Venus has way too much of a greenhouse and Mercury has no greenhouse at all. And then we have the one planet that we have to live on. And let's see if I can get us home. And let's say at least as far as life on Earth is concerned, for the last billions of years, this has been a greenhouse that has worked very well for us, kept us in the right temperature range, and all of the life on Earth has evolved and adapted to living in this greenhouse the way that it is configured until recently because that of course is what our purpose of our class is so if you want to think about climate change on this planetary context what humans have done to this planet in only about two centuries or so three centuries is that we have changed the atmosphere in a way that has caused this greenhouse to be more effective at trapping heat and most of you who've studied climate change already will know that that gas primarily is carbon dioxide, although there are other greenhouse gases like methane and uh, nitrogen dioxide that also contribute to the trapping of heat. By far, the greatest one that we have added to the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. And just to give you a rough number, since 1790, that's around the time when the United States first became a country, humans have added 40% more CO2 to the atmosphere of the planet. Now, CO2 is still a tiny, tiny percentage of our air, less, much less than 1% of our atmosphere. But we've changed how much is in there, increased it by 40%. You may not think that that is a big deal, but everything that we've seen on the surface of the Earth is telling us that that is a big deal. That increase by 40% has made the greenhouse more effective at trapping heat it's like we added another layer of that sheeting to the greenhouse where my neighbors grow their salad, and all of a sudden, the same sun is warming us up even more than it used to because our planet is holding on to more heat. And that is the essence of what we call global warming, and that is causing climate change all over the world that we can already see. So let me give you another way to understand how we figured this out. How did we know that the world was warming up? For that, I'm going to go back to the app called Living Earth. This one is just about planet Earth. But what I like about this app is that it gives you a snapshot of what's going on around the world at any given moment. And I've chosen some locations in different countries and different continents just to show you that at any given moment, Earth is a lot of temperatures all at the same time. 
And I hope to you know, hear questions from you folks if you have a, a question or comment about this as we go along. But I'm gonna start here where I am sitting in Barnett, Vermont, where it's 36 right now. And if I advance, uh, San Francisco, California at this very moment is 45 degrees. Hialeah, Florida, where I grew up as a kid is 77 degrees. New York City is right now 48 degrees. London is at this moment 55 degrees and it's a partly cloudy day. Baghdad, Iraq, even though it looks like uh, the sun is setting on them, it's 76 degrees right now. Mumbai in India is 86 degrees and it's nighttime. In Shanghai, China, 55 degrees in the middle of the night. Sydney, Australia, 67 degrees in the middle of the night. Timbuktu in the Sahara Desert, 104 degrees as we speak right now. And tonight their low is gonna be 70. And Kampala in Uganda, in a much more temperate part of Africa in you know close to a forested region as opposed to a uh, desert region. In Kampala, it's 81 degrees right now. Long Yerbien, which is the farthest north city where people can live. It's springtime, so they're starting to get a little sunlight up there, but it's still one below zero at this moment. And if I go to McMurdo Station, which is on the coast of Antarctica, it's 12 below zero. By the way, in case you're not familiar, it's actually fall in the Southern Hemisphere. So they're about to plunge into six months of darkness and they won't see the sun there until September. But that's in Antarctica. And if I go to the South Pole itself, let's see, sometimes the weather data doesn't load. Ooh, it's not even fully winter there and it's 62 below zero in the South Pole. So wherever you are, don't complain about the weather, okay? It could be 62 below zero on, on one part of Earth right now while the rest of us are much warmer. So the point of showing you all these temperatures, and let me jump back to where we are now, is to show you that the Earth is a very dynamic system. There's a lot of numbers going on here and there's a lot of temperatures at the same time. So how would it be possible for us to even know if the planet is warming up or cooling down as a whole? Uh, I see somebody requested Russia. I hadn't listed Russia <laughs> in my uh, <laughs> uh, targets. I probably should have put uh, St. Petersburg and Vladivostok and because Russia is such a big country. They have lots of temperatures within the same country. Um, but the point of this is just to show you, this is a mathematical exercise. This part is actually not that complicated, but it could connect to skills you've already learned in your math class, like the concept of the mean or the average. So instead of trying to figure out, you know, one place or another, what you could do is map out a number of weather stations map their average, their temperatures, and then add all of those temperatures up and divide by the number of weather stations. And then you would get an average temperature for the planet at that moment. And then if you revisit those weather stations every month, every year, and get that average number again, then you could get an idea of whether or not the world is warming up or cooling down. And we can also do that for one particular spot. The Fairbanks Museum in St. Johnsbury, where I work normally, is also a weather station, as many of you know, from our eye in the sky meteorologists that are famous, you know, on the radio. Uh, our weather station is the oldest weather station in the state of Vermont. We have weather data that is continuous every single day from 1895 to now. And our meteorologists continue to collect that data. And if you can imagine how valuable that is for a climate scientist, a, a spot on the earth in a rural town that hasn't really developed in a great way differently than it was in the past. I mean, we haven't all of a sudden put in skyscrapers in a mall. You know, St. Johnsbury is the same kind of village that it's always been for hundreds of years. And since 1895 to now, we have this weather station in the backyard of the Fairbanks Museum, recording the high temperature, the low temperature, how much rainfall, uh, uh, the wind, all these are constantly being recorded. And the great thing is that we have this available on the website. So I'm actually gonna switch now to our Fairbanks Museum website. Hold on, got so many things here. I gotta get that tab open first. All you're gonna see is my Zoom invitations. All right, folks, just one more second. 
Okay. There's the Fairbanks Museum's website, right? Is that up on the screen, Lila? Just making sure. So our Fairbanks Museum website, which you probably already visited today if you were looking for how to get into this class. Well, when you go back on there, go to the eye in the sky section and look down here where it says summaries for St. Johnsbury's climate. And this is where you can open a treasure chest of data that is incredibly valuable. If you were a climate scientist, this is like getting a big golden chest, wide open, filled with information. So here, well, I'm going to just show you a basic average idea. This is all of the years between 1894 and 2019 averaged together. So this doesn't show us if the climate is changing or not. This kind of just tells you what you should expect from living in a place like St. Johnsbury. So if you live in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, like I do, you're not going to be surprised to find out that the coldest month of the year is January. And you're not going to be surprised to find out that July is the warmest month. But just remember how averages work. If 81.8 is the average high for July, does that mean every day is going to be 81.8? No. It can get a lot hotter than that. It could be up to 100. It could also be freakishly cold in July. But that's the average. So when we talk about climate, we're not talking about the same thing as weather. We're talking about expectations. Weather is what's happening now. That changes from minute to minute. Climate is what you should be expecting. A simple way to put it is if you're planning a vacation in Vermont and you're coming in July, you probably should bring tank tops and shorts. Even if you're planning your vacation in January when it's snowing, you know that in the summer it gets warm. That's the climate. Does that mean that it couldn't snow in the middle of July and ruin your vacation plans because your flip-flops are not going to cut it? That could happen. That's crazy weather. But it's not likely because you have a climate expectation. You know St. Jay is going to be warm in July, cold in January, so you act accordingly. That doesn't mean the weather has to follow your plans. It just means that you have a climate that you can expect. So that's our averages. Okay, look at the low for January. 6.5 is the average low in the month of January. But we know if we live in Vermont that it can get what much, much colder than that. We can get down to 20 below, 30 below. And although it hasn't happened since the 1950s, there is a record in St. Johnsbury of 43 below zero recorded at the Fairbanks Museum. Maybe that temperature will never happen again. Maybe it'll happen this winter. That's how weather is. But how do we know if the climate is changing? How do we know if these temperatures are moving in one direction or another? For that, you need to go averages of year to year. And that's where I'm going to show you the part of the website that has the most powerful climate data right here. It says trends, yearly means. So just to be clear, trends does not mean which hashtags are popular on Twitter right now. OK, but that's what people tend to think of trends as meaning now trends, meaning is which direction is, are the changes going? Is it going up? Is it going down or is it staying the same? So let's go to yearly means on the website. And here we have the mean temperatures from year to year for St. Johnsbury. And you don't need to be a statistician to read that it's increasing. You can see that the slope is heading up. In the 1890s, it was down here. In the 2000s, it's up here. But what's this red line and the blue line? What do they mean? Well, if you look at the bottom of the graph, you can see that the blue line says mean temperature, making it flash. This is one year to the next. So you can actually see how there are cold years and hot years, one right after the other. There could be a really warm year, 1921, and 1926 was a pretty cold year compared to that. But that noise up and down, up and down, it looks like the stock market lately, you know, that kind of thing doesn't really tell you where things are heading because one year and the next can be very different from each other. But if you want to see a trend, another useful thing is to take a seven year running average, which is what you see this red line meaning that I'm making flash. What this means is that they take the seven years prior to that year and average them together to kind of get an idea of if that seven year block is different from the seven year block after and the seven year block before. So a running average just helps you smooth out the data to get rid of some of that constant change noise and see if there is an underlying signal of a trend, something that is changing. And I can tell you that 42.44, uh, roughly right there, let's say, let's, was the average temperature for the seven years prior to 1899, 42 degrees. 
right now, if we go to the latest number from the running average that ends at 2016, 45. And if you look at that 42 to 45, that's more than three degrees different. Now, you might say, that's not a big deal, three degrees. What's the, I mean, it might be 36 now. It'll be 39 degrees later this afternoon. That's three degrees. That's not a big deal. But we're not talking about weather. We're not talking about a day getting warmer as the sun comes out. We're talking about an average temperature for the entire town for the entire year of three degrees increase. Now, just so you know, 42 was the average when we started doing our weather records. And some of you may know that 12,000 years ago or earlier than that, St. John's area was buried by the glaciers of the Ice Age. During the Ice Age, the average temperature for a place like St. Johnsbury would have been around 36. So six degrees colder than we are now, and we'd be buried by ice. <laughs> so a six degree change negative is huge. And now since the Fair Museum was built, St. Johnsbury has seen a three degree increase in the positive. So if six degrees down from the average gave us an ice age, what would six degrees up from the average give us? Well, that is what, unfortunately, people in Vermont are probably going to be finding out over the next couple of decades because climate change is here. We've already seen it. And there's a lot of ways that it's already impacted people's lives. For example, right now in the middle of Vermont, it's maple sugaring season right now. And I actually got to meet the folks that run the Proctor Maple Research Center for University of Vermont. And I interviewed the scientists there. And I got to see the data. And since the 1950s, the maple sugaring season in Vermont has shrunk by 50%. So the amount of time that farmers can get sap out of the trees and turn it into the delicious syrup that I love to eat. I actually have trees tapped on my land and I get maple syrup from my farmer who lives right next to me who makes it from the trees on my land. And that amount of time that these farmers have to make this maple syrup, which is a huge part of our economy too, has reduced by 50%. So already climate change is here and Vermonters have had to adapt. And luckily we have high tech solutions like those vacuum pumps and the reverse osmosis and other really cool technologies that make it possible for maple sugar makers to make more from the less time that they have. But just so you know, climate change is not something that might happen in the future. Climate change has already begun, and we are already dealing with it here. And we are lucky because it's much worse in some parts of the country and some parts of the world as to what folks are facing. So I think I saw a question. I'm going to actually uh, turn off the website for just a second and see if I can. Somebody's asking if the middle of Vermont is like Rutland. Actually, the geographic center of Vermont is where Randolph is, Randolph, Vermont. Rutland is in the southern part of the state, just so you know, and I live in the northeastern part of the state, for those of you watching. But I'm going to go back to our website, uh, the, the Fairbanks Museum's climate summary page, because climate change doesn't just mean temperature change, okay? There's other factors that happen, and if we go down, just, just so you know, this is now the temperature max. So this is the same as the other one, but it's not average temperatures. It's just the average of all the high temperatures. So yes, the high temperatures, the hottest temperatures are also going up. What about the minimums? Those are the coldest temperatures. Those are the nightly lows, like the bottom temperature of the day in the middle of the night. And have those changed? Yes, they have. So our winters are not as cold as they used to be. Our nights are not as cold as they used to be. Um, and I go past temperate range, although you see that that's changing. That means that the difference between the high and the low is smaller, meaning our, temper our climate is moderating, meaning we're becoming less extreme, cold, hot, and more moderate, so it doesn't get so cold. It doesn't, you know, it's not an extreme difference from the heat. But I want to skip that one to go to precipitation, because this is one that's a lot easier to understand. Precipitation means anything falling out of the sky, whether it be angry birds, or no, just kidding, or snowflakes, or raindrops. So if it's winter snow, if it's hail, if it's you know summer rain, all of that counts as precipitation. And here's where we see an interesting thing. The precipitation has gone up pretty dramatically, even more dramatically than perhaps the temperatures have. So we, we see an average 37 inches in 1899, we're getting uh, about 43 inches, eh, 
you might say, yeah, four inches of rain, that's not a big deal. But if that four inches of rain came all at once, that would be a big deal. That would be a flood. I'm not saying that that's what this means, but we are certainly getting more precipitation. And if you look at the snow level, well, actually, anybody who likes to go skiing or snowboarding probably knows that that actually has not increased. So if the precipitation is increasing, but the snow is staying close to the same level, then perhaps that implies that we're getting more rain in the summer or even rain during the winter that doesn't stay as snow, but is liquid rain. So it doesn't pile up and add to the snowfall amount. So climate change is more than just temperature change. But I see a question from Leela. Yes. It looks like um, someone was asking, my house is cold. Does that have to do with climate change? And I'm thinking that might be more about the weather like you've been stating. <laughs> yeah, if your house is cold or if your house is hot, it's not climate. It's going to be the things in your house, like your heater or your air conditioner. And that is, like Lila said, a, a factor of weather. That is the daily uh, chance, the daily chances. Uh, you know, it's quarter. It's, uh, I hate to use a gambling analogy, but weather is like throwing dice. You could get anything. But a climate is what are the patterns that are most likely to happen. And is it possible for it to suddenly become 100 degrees outside and it look like July out here? Maybe that could be possible, but it's it's April in Vermont. It's extremely unlikely because I know the climate here. Even though I know it's 104 degrees in Timbuktu right now, it would be like rolling, I don't know, snake eyes seven times in a row for me to get 100 degrees here. It's in, nearly impossible, but not totally impossible. So that's what weather is, a lot of randomness. Climate is expectations. And if the climate is changing, that means that what you expect is no longer going to match what, you know, what happens. You're going to get unexpected results and things are going to happen that are not in the character of the place where you live. And that is what climate change is causing. Some places are getting less rain that they, than they expect. Some places are getting more rain than they expect. Some places are getting hotter. And it is possible for a place to get colder because of global warming. But most places are warming up we have very little evidence of places that are cooling down. And I can show you that because all of that data that I showed you for St. Johnsbury, it exists for other weather stations around the world. All around the world, in part thanks to things like the British Empire colonizing many countries on many continents, setting up weather stations on these colonies and collecting data from the 1800s until now, we have similar patterns of data from all around the world. We have tens of thousands of weather stations on planet Earth. So if we take all of those, average out their temperatures, I'm going to show you the data for that in a second after I answer this question. Go ahead, Leela. Um, someone was just saying, you know, outside is very cold, but I feel like on the temperature um, ranges that you just showed, it's it's in it's sort of in the mean of of temperatures. Like 36 is is about right for April at, or this time of year. Yeah, I'm actually going to do that just to just to uh, illustrate what you just said, Leela. Um, I'm going to go back to that first page that shows the averages. Here's April. Average high, 55. Average low, 31. Do you notice that it goes below freezing on average uh, in April, which is actually the sweet spot for our maple syrup? We actually want temperatures below freezing at night and above freezing during the day. That's what causes maximum sap pumping action from the maple trees. So this is very characteristic of April. To say that it's 38 right now in April is right within your expectation of climate. But that doesn't mean that it couldn't, it could totally happen that tomorrow the sun comes out and and the, the clouds blow away and we get this gust of air from the south and all of a sudden it's 65 degrees. It could happen in April. It happens all the time. And it could also happen that a northern gust comes with a cold front and all of a sudden we get uh, a foot of snow and it drops to 25 degrees. That also can happen in April, but it is less likely than having a, one of these temperatures. So... So just say, Joe, if you think this is cold for April, well, welcome to Vermont. That's what we're used to living here. If I lived in Florida and it was 36 degrees, I would be saying something. <laughs> I would say, this is weird. What happened? I wanted to go to the beach. Well, not today with social distancing, but you get my point. You got climate as your expectation, but you've got weather as your daily reality. And they are separate subjects, although a lot of people sometimes can use them. So uh, I want to move to a different data set now, as we're, we're running uh, through this pretty quickly. But I hope you understand 
all of this concepts of physics, the sunlight, the heat, and and also the atmospheric dynamics. This is climate science. This is meteorology. To understand this concept, you have to take a lot of different disciplines like astronomy and physics and meteorology and combine them to get the big picture. And now is actually a time I want to show you the big picture. Uh, I want to go to a video that comes from NASA. Um, this is a video that NASA created by taking all of the weather data from different web, uh, I mean, weather stations all around the world and averaging it out over the centuries that we have. In fact, basically, uh, here, here's the video on my video player here. I hope you can see that. Mm -hmm. This video is the version that's in Fahrenheit, although scientists use Celsius. I didn't want to make the Celsius Fahrenheit thing another thing for you folks to worry about. So this one is telling us in Fahrenheit. And before I get started, if by pressing play, I want you to see the, the, uh, the scale on the side here, where if the white color is present, that means that change is not happening. A zero means that that area is staying the same over its four-year running average. They're using four-year running averages here, not seven, just so you know. So you see on the bottom, it says 1880 to 1884. So without pressing play, you can see that during that four-year window, mo a lot of places that are colored white stayed the same temperature. A few places, like on the west coast of Africa here, got hotter than average. And a couple places, like this part, uh, Western Australia or the northern part of South America, were a little bit below average. That's for that four-year period compared to you know what they had then. But in the 1880s represents the time when precision thermometers. Are so we we have been monitoring the weather for centuries, but we just didn't have the precision necessary until mercury thermometers started getting used. That those are very reliable. Now we use all kinds of other things like digital thermometers and satellites and all kinds of other things. But Putting that in mind, let's press play on this and see how, as the decades go by, this changes. So I'm going to make sure the player bar is out of the way, and let's let it roll. So as you go through the 1900s, you see that some places are colder than average, some places are warmer than average, some places are staying the same. If climate change wasn't happening, the map would kind of be even numbers of blue and red sections and white sections kind of moving around like a blob. But let's see if any particular colors start to take over. I think it's pretty obvious what's going on here just from the color changes. Now, in the last four-year bracket that we have here, 2014 to 2018, almost nobody is having below average temperatures. A few pockets like uh, Tierra del Fuego around here on South America, and the, some parts of the coast of Antarctica are a little bit below average, but almost everybody on Earth is experiencing warmer temperatures than they're used to. And if you had to pick a region of the Earth that seems to be warming up fastest of all, I think it's obvious from this civilization that you can see that is the Arctic, the northern polar region, that is warming up the fastest. This has been known to scientists for a while, but this data gives us this information, and this is made from weather data collected on the ground. But starting in the 1970s, we started using satellites to give us another way of understanding this data, and that's what I'm gonna switch to next after I answer this question. So let me uh, see, what's up? It's um, So someone was asking if there's an invention to stop climate change that is very dramatic. <laughs> so is there a way of, of sort of slowing all of this down? Well, let me give you an inspiring thought. There's already an invention on Earth that is excellent at taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it into a way where it cannot hurt our climate. This is an invention that's been around for, I think, around 300 million years. It's called a tree. <laughs> OK, I'm not being silly here, but trees are the ultimate climate change fighters in a sense in that they do the opposite uh, of what we've been doing. They take CO2 out of the air instead of pumping it into the air. But it's not a realistic thing right now to expect all of the trees to be able to do this all at once. We would have to plant enormous numbers of forests, and then it would still take decades for those trees to suck the CO2 out of the air. But 
that is something that would eventually work. And so a lot of scientists and engineers and inventors are trying to figure out, is there a way that we can speed up this process? Is there a way we can make artificial photosynthesis or create electronic trees uh, or a chemically engineered tree that can do it like a regular tree does, but on a larger scale so we can clean up the atmosphere faster. And trust me that it would be a great invention if anybody could make it. But just so you know, we already have maples and oaks and pines that can do the same thing. Um, in fact, just as a side note, a cool thing to think about, I just read about this in a book. If you plant a seed in a big bucket of soil, you weigh the soil and you weigh the seed, and then you let a tree grow in that soil. And let's say the tree gets to be 10 feet tall. If you weigh the soil and let's say you take the tree out of the bucket, the soil will still weigh the same. The tree did not turn the soil into wood. Do you know where the wood came from? From the air. So the weight of a tree is mostly the carbon that it sucked out of the air. So think about that. A tree is made of the weight of the carbon that it took out of the air. Yes. So uh, one question relating earlier to what you were saying that Antarctica is getting very hot. So, so someone was saying, why is that happening? Or maybe you were saying the Arctic, they're just asking about Ant Antarctica getting so hot. No, uh, well, Antarctica everywhere is generally warming. There are some places in Antarctica where there might be a slight cooling, but then let's think about what else could be going on. There could be more cloud cover there. So instead of getting sunlight, they're getting more clouds. So they might have a less heat in one particular place, but it's also a factor of climate change. For example, let's say there's a part of Antarctica that used to be sunny and dry, and now it snows more. There's more clouds that might actually cause it to be cooler. And you might say, oh, it's warming, it's uh, cooling down there, climate change isn't happening. But that extra snow and extra cloud cover might be a direct effect of the warming somewhere else, causing air to move into Antarctica that used to not reach there. We see, we're seeing that in a lot of ways. I didn't want to get into the nitty gritty details, but for example, in, in Antarctica, one of the issues that they're noticing is that warm water from other parts of the ocean is now uh, reaching underneath those glaciers and those ice tongues that hold the glaciers in place. So a lot of scientists are worried that warm water might seep in under the glaciers and melt them from below and cause them to collapse and slide into the ocean. So that is something that is water moving from another part of the world into the Antarctic Ocean where it's usually colder. And that's actually being witnessed not just by the glaciers, but also uh, biologists that work in the Antarctic have noticed species that used to be off the coast of South America are now moving off to the coast of Antarctica because the water there is warm enough that they can adapt to a very different environment because it's similar to the southern coast of South America now. So it's a very complicated subject, climate change. And there's a million little pieces working. Like think of all the gears inside of an old-fashioned clock. All of these gears have different functions and they don't make themselves obvious. But what we do know is that the heating of the earth is kind of like running the system faster. So everything is hotter, more dynamic storms have more energy to form. Wind can be more powerful. Clouds can drop more rain. These are some of the actual effects that climate change is already showing on the earth. So this class was not really to run down everything that's happening because you know, that, that would be a different class altogether, but just to give you the fundamental basic physics of why our planet is changing this way. And I'm gonna show you some more things after I answer this question. Yes, Leela. Um, just one more related, is global warming killing the animals in Antarctica? Well, there are, I, I'm not gonna make a, a prediction as to what's gonna go extinct in Antarctica, but I will say this. There are many things that live in the water around Antarctica that are adapted to that particular temperature regime. And they won't uh, be able to survive if the water's much warmer, partly because they'll have competition from creatures that aren't so hardy. So if the water gets warmer, all those like tropical creatures will be like, hey, it's not so cold, we can survive here and we can outcompete you for food. And the cold adapted ones are like, oh, where are all these strangers coming from? They're eating all of our food. For example, what if, this is a hypothetical scenario, but what if penguins, which are adapted to Antarctica, start getting more competition from creatures like dolphins that normally wouldn't go there, but suddenly decide, hey, we can handle Antarctica. It's not as cold as it used to be. Let's go hunting for fish there. And all of a sudden, the penguins have a new competitor. So penguins might be okay 
as Antarctica is now, but if penguins have less fish to hunt, uh, or if the ice, you know, uh, you know, affects their ability to find those fish, then the penguin could be endangered because of climate change, uh, too. So I'm not saying penguins are endangered because of climate change. However, there are scientists trying to study that. I'm just trying to give you a scenario as to how the domino effect of one thing changing, causing another species to appear, causing another species to have a hard time finding its food. This is one of the scenarios that we can see happening all over the place. Um, you know, even in Vermont, we have birds that are coming in here that are not usually seen here. And maybe some of them will start living in Vermont and competing with the birds that are native here. And that could cause problems. And even some species that we're used to seeing might disappear because they can't handle the competition from newly arrived species. Or to put it on another uh, less pleasant note, ticks. When I moved to Vermont over 20 years ago, nobody saw ticks here. They just were not a part of life. I grew up in Florida where ticks were a part of life. So I knew about ticks. The, a lot of the old time Vermonters that I met had never even seen a tick before. And then now everybody's got ticks. And ticks is another example of an animal that is moving, migrating because of climate change, allowing it to survive. I happen to know that if it was 30 below zero consistently during the winter, that would kill most ticks. It used to get 30 below zero consistently during the winters here, but it's been a while since we get those temperatures consistently. So this is how climate change affects animal species for the better or for the worse. We have things that are living here that didn't used to live here before because Vermont is warmer now. And this story is going to be unfortunately repeating itself over and over again all around the world as animals migrate, plants migrate, uh, even fungi migrate to different places where they haven't grown before because of climate change. So I hope that answers that question. And let me see where I can uh, see if we have a chance to wrap things up. Well, I wanted to uh, connect what we talked about with the global average temperatures. Let's see if I can switch to a different video here. Uh, hold on a second. Are you seeing the Arctic ice, Lila? This is Greenland and Alaska. Is that video up? Okay. So this is a video also from NASA that talks about Arctic ice. And now I'm going to press play on this because this starts in January 1984. This is satellite-based data, and it tells you the age of the sea ice. If you look at the legend on the right, ice that is less than a year old is this color. Ice that's more than four years old is this brighter white color. And this big white section in the middle is the Arctic sea ice. This is not on land. I just want to be very clear. Greenland on the right, that is land. And that is the place that has a glacier that's over a mile thick in the center. But the Arctic ice cap up here is actually frozen ocean. And this is the habitat for polar bears. Polar bears, uh, that's an animal that's become the symbol of climate change in a way. Polar bears rely on this ice to hunt because the cracks in this ice are the places where seals and whales are constantly coming up to breed. And that's how polar bears hunt the majority of their food. So this ice is their hunting platform. That's why polar bears are technically considered a marine mammal. Even though you don't think of them as swimming as much as you think of them as walking, they spend the majority of their life on the ocean, on the frozen ocean, but it's still the ocean. So with that in mind, let me press play. And let me show you how Arctic sea ice is a dynamic thing. In the winters, it spreads out. Look at Alaska's coast and the Greenland coast. You can see the ice spreading way out in the winter and then shrinking back to a smaller core in the summer. That is a natural thing that has been happening on Earth forever, at least since humans have been observing it. So the ice is smallest in the summer, biggest in the winter, right? So here we go, so winter, summer. Big ice, little ice. But here's what else you notice in this video. Notice the big permanent ice cap is getting changed in how old the ice is on it. The old ice, the stuff that's over four years old, is actually a smaller percentage of that ice cap. So a lot of it is actually younger ice. And that also means thinner ice that is more vulnerable to melting. And so as we get closer to now, we're around to the year 2000, you can see shrinking and growing ice, shrinking and growing ice. But every time it shrinks, it's a little bit smaller than it was the fall before. So 
March is the month that we have the greatest amount of ice in the, in the Arctic. And September is the month that we have the lowest amount of ice in the Arctic. That's just following the seasons. The end of winter, the most ice. The end of summer, the least ice, right? So now you can see that by 2009, the old ice is actually a tiny sliver of what it used to be. That's part of the concern for the polar bears. And I know we're running up against the time limit because we've hit about an hour of our class. So don't worry. I know our time is almost up and I will be wrapping this up. But if you can take this, this, this might be hard to see the trend because it's showing you summer and winter. So let me switch to a different video now that is just the minimums in September, just the time when the ice is expected to be at its smallest. And we're going to compare one year to the next. And that's where we'll, just like we said with the trends before, let's see, Leela, can you see that? Which shows the right, ice cap? Okay, I'm gonna hit play on this. This is two dimensional data. What we're measuring is the area in square, kilom in square kilometers of the ice, but it's comparing September to September, not the whole year because we're looking at the minimum, okay? The minima. So that red line that you see going up and down is just like that weather data graph that I showed you, up and down, highs and lows, but Let's see if we can establish a trend here. Whoa, 2007 was one of the worst years. So where it ends, you can see, okay, is some years better than others? Sure. Are some years much uh, more ice than the years before? Sure. But what is the trend that we see? Well, when we started doing this in the 70s, the average was around six and a half million square kilometers. And now we're down to about four million square kilometers, which is a lot less ice for polar bears. So if you were a polar bear biologist and you saw this, you would say, wow, their habitat is like half the size of what it used to be, which means their habitat is disappearing, which is why the polar bears listed as an endangered species, listed as an endangered species specifically because of human caused climate change. So that is why the polar bear has rightfully become a symbol of climate change. And as just to end this off, I, I, in a way to help you extend your math skills, this was looking at area, which is a two dimensional measurement, right? But now I wanna, hold on, for some reason I can't find the video that I wanna show you. I wanna look at volume. And that video, oh, here it is. Okay, can you see those two cubes, Leela? Two cubic mm -hmm. state things. Okay, yep. this is a video uh, that was created by uh, Andy Lee Robinson. It's on YouTube where they took the data, but notice this is cubic kilometers, not square kilometers. So we're talking about the size, width, and length, and depth of the ice all factored together. And what's clever about Mr. Robinson's uh, demonstration here is that they turned this cube into the size of what it would be if all that ice was stacked up on the Earth as a map. So you know, it's kind of a clever device for this. But these are real numbers that also come from NASA and actually from the Navy. The US Navy calculated this with their submarines long ago, too. So what we see is not only is the area of the Arctic ice decreasing from year to year, but perhaps more dramatically, the thickness, meaning the volume of the ice is also going way down. So area was about half lost, but if you look at this, the volume is more than, a, uh, you know, th almost three quarters of it is lost, okay? We're talking about more than two thirds of the volume gone. So when you hear people talk about climate change in the Arctic, this is the alarming stuff that people see, but that's not the only place that's being affected. I, I, I know our time is up, so I'm gonna, you know, just put up this uh, for a second. And let me see, I hope if you, if you folks, we can wrap this up by, if there's any questions, please ask. But uh, here is a picture of just the United States last year, 2019, all of the weather and climate disasters that cost more than a billion dollars to fix, okay? So this is not about polar bears. This is about pocketbooks, you could say. This is about people's houses getting uh, flooded. This is about tornadoes and hurricanes becoming more frequent and more powerful. Wildfires in, in California, and I don't even need to bring up what happened in Australia, but all of you probably remember the news with all the bushfires in Australia. All of these things are getting more frequent and more devastating 
this is also related to climate change. Places are changing. The expectations of what we should be seeing are not happening. And California, for example, is getting a way less snow, way less rain than they're used to. So their forests, which were used to growing in a certain climate, are now finding that that climate is too dry. And in some places, the forests are burning up and not regrowing or not able to recover from this. So that is the bad news. And that is not what I wanted to spend all of our time on. But uh, uh, unless anybody has any questions, I wanted to put a funny little point on this. Uh, when people think about climate science, they usually don't think about people who lived in other centuries. But here is a gentleman named Svant Arrhenius. He was a Swedish chemist, and he was born in 1859. He died in 1927, and he so he almost di he died almost 100 years ago. However, in the 1890s, he did work with with gases like carbon dioxide and light, and he actually discovered that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. And he figured out that if you doubled the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you would increase the temperature of the Earth by roughly six degrees. He predicted that, but not because he thought climate change was happening, but because he was trying to understand why ice ages happened in the past. So he made a connection between climate uh, and carbon dioxide back in the 1890s, which is around the same time that the Fairbanks Museum opened. And he was a Swedish scientist, so I'm wondering if anybody's seeing the connection because there is a genetic family connection between Zvantarinius and a very famous Swedish young woman who today is perhaps the face of climate change activism. I'm talking about uh, Greta Thunberg. So here is a descendant or a relative of Zvantarinius, also from Sweden, who's also become a famous person in the history of climate science. So I just think it's a funny connection. They're relatives, and they both uh, have made their lives uh, celebrated about their advocacy for climate. So uh, I'm going to end it there, unless I see that Lila says there's a question I would love to there, answer. Yeah, you. there's one more question, and we should definitely wrap it up. Um, why is the ice that's melting changing Florida, which is m like millions of miles away? Ah. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna make this as quick as I can. That sea ice that we're talking about in the Arctic is not actually changing the level of the ocean because it's already in the ocean. But if you wanna understand why sea level is rising, there are two things. Glaciers that are on land, like Greenland, are also melting. And that's water that's on land that's now sliding into the ocean. And the ocean is one ocean. So if you add water to one side of the world's ocean, it's going to add water to all of the world's ocean. And so, yes, a glacier sliding into the ocean by Greenland is going to make Florida see a higher sea level. That is because we all live on one planet. Earth doesn't understand what a border is. Our environment and our air does not follow national territories. It goes everywhere. So if ice happens to slide into the ocean in Antarctica, it will affect Florida. That's what living on a planet means. You share everything, the air, the ocean. So uh, some people have not wake awakened to this concept yet. And they think, oh, well, we don't have to worry about that here. But when it comes to air blowing and ocean cir circulation, there, there is no difference between here or there. We're all on one planet. But ocean levels are rising for another reason besides ice sliding into the water from glaciers on land. As you heat up water, it actually expands. I don't want you to make a mess in your kitchen, but this is an easy thing to prove. If you take a stove uh, pot, you know, a little cooking pot and fill it up to the brim, maybe you've made this mistake before trying to make some ramen or spaghetti in really quick. If you fill that cooking pot up to the top and then turn on the flames and heat up the water, well, like I said, you're gonna have a mess because that water is not gonna fit inside of that pan. As it gets hotter, it's going to expand, and what filled up the pan to the brim will overflow the brim in a few minutes after it heats up. Now, I'm not saying the Earth is on a, on a stove getting heated up by a gas range, but as we increase the temperatures of the air, we increase the temperatures of the ocean. The ocean actually takes up more space, and you can go on NASA's climate.gov um, climate website and see uh, right now how much the ocean levels have already risen and are rising on a current uh, basis on that uh, website, you can see that oceans are rising 3.3 millimeters per year right now. And so if I lived in Florida, which I did used to I, as a kid, that would concern me very much. There are already places in the Keys where the towns have decided that they have to 
abandon certain neighborhoods because they're not going to be able to afford to build up the levels of seawalls and roads to protect certain neighborhoods. So there's already places in like Florida that we know are going to be uninhabitable within a few years or decades because of the ocean level rising. So yeah, yeah, Florida is not where the polar bears live. But Florida is experiencing climate change just like anywhere else. So you can, that's one great website, climate, climate.nasa.gov is one stop where you can find out about this. And if I, if I had one more website to recommend, the National Snow and Ice Data Center, if you want to go there and look at the sea ice news, you can get actually a daily update as to what size the sea ice is at any particular moment. And we can see right now it is the end of winter. So the ice was just at its biggest. And let's look at, uh-oh, unfortunately, 2020 is worse than any year that we've recorded in the Arctic ice. That dotted line is 2012, which was the previous worst year. And this gray band is the average. So we could say that the Arctic ice is well below the average. And now it's coming into the summertime when it shrinks even more. So I'm not, I don't want to be bringing bad news, but as far as the Arctic ice is concerned, it is continuing to shrink. So you live in a greenhouse. How many layers of plastic in a greenhouse affects how hot it is? What gases are in our atmosphere affect how hot our greenhouse planet is? And humans have been adding a lot of CO2 and other gases, and now we're seeing the results. It was predicted in the 1890s. This is not new. And now we're seeing that it's real. So maybe in the future we'll have another class about how to combat climate change. Maybe we'll, we'll come up with some classes on the good news and the fact that we have a lot of technologies like solar and wind and electric cars and even possible big future technologies like fusion reactors that already could save us from this problem. The problem is now not inventing the stuff, but putting it into place and using it. But on that note, I hope you enjoyed this lesson, and I hope you go on our Fairbanks Museum website and look at the climate data that we have and go on those other sites and, and get to know as much as you can about this subject. So I thank you for tuning in on this uh, uh, snowy, rainy day. And thank you, Leela, for being such a great host for all of the questions and everything yeah, going on. And thank you, Bobby, for all your, your time and effort with this class. That was great. Um, and again, we'll be starting another class at 1 o'clock on um, composting at home. So thank you so much, and take care.